For some time, I've been thinking about what I could be preaching this year as we enter into a new year. Um, my preference is to pick a book of the Bible and just go through it verse by verse, chapter by chapter as we preach through it together. And uh, of course, you might take a break here or there to uh, preach on the resurrection or Easter or whatever it might be. But as I thought about that, I thought it would be really good for us to preach through the book of Acts. And so that's what we're doing. We're starting a new sermon series today called that I'm calling Anti-Fragile Faith. And it's going to be verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Acts. So if you'd like to join me there, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 is what we're reading. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Good morning. Hear now the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's by the reading of God's holy word, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Some of us might remember a time when... Uh, when there was regular TV programming, and we had a TV show that we enjoyed, and you would get one episode of that TV show, and then you would have to wait a whole week before you could watch the next episode. Can you believe it? You couldn't binge a TV show and watch every single episode in one night. You had to wait another week until the next episode came out, and that was always the most fun part about TV because it would end on a cliffhanger, right? But as many of you also know, a lot can happen in a week. And maybe so much happens that you forgot what had happened at the end of last week's TV episode that came out. And so the people who put those TV shows together thought it would be important, it would be a good idea to have something right at the beginning of that new episode that started like this. Previously on Law and Order, so, uh, Special Victims Unit. You know what I'm talking about, right? And then in about 30 seconds, they would show you all the important parts about everything that happened in the last episode. Well, here we are at the beginning of the book of Acts. And Luke, the author of the book of Acts, in these first five verses, is essentially doing a previously on the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Because if you know anything about Luke and Acts, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and Acts is like a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. It's the second part to the same book. It is continuing that story. And so we're meant to, we're intended to, we're supposed to read Luke and go straight to the Gospel of Acts and read what came after, what happened after. In the first five verses, that's exactly what Luke is doing. If there's anything that I think Luke is trying to communicate, the one main point that he's trying to communicate is that the people of Christ continue the work of Christ. The people of Christ continue the work of Christ. Or you could say the body of Christ, the church, continues the work of Christ after his ascension. The spirit-embodied people continue the work of Christ, the incarnate work of Christ. And we have three points this morning that come from our text. The first is the commandments that were previously given. The second is the resurrection clearly proven. And the third is the Holy Spirit truly promised. 
So commandments previously given, resurrection clearly proven, Holy Spirit truly promised. Let's look at that first point together. Right at the beginning of the book of Acts, Luke goes, in the first book of Theophilus. So there we go. We're clued into the fact that this is a second book in a series. The first book is the Gospel of Luke. And his audience, the person he's writing to, he says, O oh, Theophilus. Now if we go back to the Gospel of Luke, right at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, we'll have a very similar beginning to his statement here. At the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Luke says this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now what you need to know about Luke is that Luke was a physician. He's a doctor. He's an educated man. And Luke became a follower of Jesus, and he thought it would be important to compile a, a document explaining all the things that happened in the life of Jesus and the building of the church. And so Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke to this man that he calls Theophilus. Now the word Theophilus, the name Theophilus, means lover of God. The, the word Theo in Greek is God, and Philios is the same word that we have for Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And so Theophilus is the name, lover of God or friend of God. And some people have looked at this name to say that Luke is just writing to a general audience of people who are friends of God. But others have said Theophilus is an actual person, maybe somebody who is um, uh, wealthy, somebody who is providing the funds for Luke to do this work that he's doing to create these documents, the Gospel of Luke and, and, and the book of Acts. Uh, but, but what Luke says is that the reason why he wrote the, the Gospel of Luke, and we can say by extension the, the, the book of Acts, is so that Theophilus may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. May have certainty about these things. And so Luke says in the book, beginning of the book of Acts, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, don't go past that word too quickly. It implies something, doesn't it? Doesn't it? When, when Luke says, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, what is he implying by that? There's more to be done, right? That he's only began in the, Luke of, in the book of, of, of the Luke, Gospel of Luke. But Jesus, he's only began to do. And so he's got more to do. He's doing more. And so many people have said maybe a better name for the book, the Acts of the Apostles, would be the Acts of Jesus carried out by the Apostles through the power and operation of the Holy Spirit. But you know what? That's a really long title for a book. So we just call it Acts, right? Or the Acts of the Apostles. But what Luke is saying here is that this book, the book of Acts, is an explanation about what Jesus continued to do, but not in the same way he did so in the Gospel of Luke. So this is all that Jesus began to do and teach. And then he goes on to say, until the day when he was taken up. Until the day when he was taken up. Now, I don't know uh, about you, but prior to going to the previous church that I pastored at, I hadn't heard much about this particular holy day in the calendar of uh, the Christian church. At, at the previous church that I was at, they were very keen on, on following what they call these feast days. And so um, what was different about that church 
than any church that had gone to before is we would have an actual uh, worship service on Thanksgiving Day. We would have an actual worship service on Christmas Day. And so the people in that tradition, they always said Christmas is the hardest time because this is what you'd have. You, if Christmas wasn't on a Sunday, you'd have to preach Christmas Day, then Sunday the Lord's Day, and then depending on when New Year's Eve fell, you'd have a New Year's Eve service to preach on, and then you'd have a New Year's Day service to preach on. Right? That's a lot of preaching. Christmas Day, uh, Sunday, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, Sunday. So back in the older days, they would swap pastors, pulpit swapping, so that the pastor that preached on Christmas Day could preach what he preached on Christmas Day, and another person in the church on the, on the Lord's, you see what I'm saying. But they had these feast days, right? And so what do, you, what do you think of? You think of after New Year's Day, New, Year, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, what's the next holy day in the church calendar? Does anybody know? It's Good Friday, right? And then after Good Friday, what is it? Easter, and then after Easter, what's the next holy day after that? Do you know the, uh, the celebrated Christian uh, holy day after that? Do you know? After Easter. Hmm? Anybody? No. <laughs> that is too American. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it is actually a day called Ascension Day. And that is that the church for many, many years not only celebrated the day that Jesus resurrected from the grave, but they celebrated the day that Jesus, after his time with his disciples, after his resurrection, ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father in heaven. You, know, you ever read the end of the Gospels where Jesus goes, he, he's carried away in a cloud and they can't see him anymore? Jesus ascends to sit at the right hand of the Father. And why exactly do you think they would celebrate that Ascension Day? Because it is that Ascension Day where Jesus went. He completed his work. He went up. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. It's a very important day in church history. And that's exactly what Luke is talking about here. When Jesus ascended, he was taken up to sit at the right hand of the Father. And then he says, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. At the end of the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 24, Jesus gave a number of commands to his disciples by the Holy Spirit. In verse 44, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them, and while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. So what are these commandments? Jesus says, everything that was spoken about me must be fulfilled. Now you are to be my witnesses. But the thing you have to do first is this very important four-letter word, you have to wait. Wow, that's a very hard thing to do, isn't it? Wait. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait. My kids can't even wait for me to pour them a glass of milk. I get mad when my fast food isn't fast enough. When my high-speed internet's going at about medium. I get mad when I can't skip to the next episode in a, in a series, a TV series that I'm binging on Netflix. Wait. Wait. Wait for what? We're going to be talking a lot about that. 
in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is about what the Holy Spirit is doing in the people of God. How he empowers us to be the body of Christ in this world. To being the bringers of good news. What about the resurrection clearly proven? Verse 3. Luke, speaking to Theophilus, said of Jesus, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, many people think that the Christian faith is, um, is something that is not deeply thought out. It's something that people who are less educated lean on to explain things that can't be explained by science and our modern technology and sophisticated way of thinking of things. Uh, some people think that the Christianity is all, all about just jumping into this mass of unknowns and just um, uh, hoping that you're right about these things. But, but, but Luke writes to Theophilus that he might have certainty about the things that he have, has been taught. And, and Luke says of Jesus that he presented himself alive to the disciples, to the apostles, after his suffering by many proofs. And you can read the Gospels and you can get the sense that Jesus is appearing over and over again. Thomas isn't there, so what does Jesus do? Jesus appears when Thomas is there, and he says, put your hand in my side. Look at the holes in my hands. Look, I'm really here. Jesus is, is there, and they're like, you must be a ghost. And so what does anybody do who's being accused of being a ghost? He eats some food. <laughs> does a ghost eat? No, I, I'm really here. I'm really me. In fact, what Luke does here is he says, that for 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to them over and over again because, because sometimes they'd forget. Sometimes they'd think, hmm, I don't know if this is really happening. In fact, Jesus appeared with two guys who were walking to Emmaus, talking about everything that had happened, and, and he disguised himself in some supernatural way, and he walked up to him, and he's like, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they're talking about how we thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah and everything that's happened. And, and then Jesus did one of the coolest things that I, I wish I was there in this moment. He had a Bible study with them about everywhere that he is in the Old Testament. Wouldn't that be great if Jesus could just sit down at our Bible study with us and just point out everywhere that he is being revealed in the Old Testament scriptures? Like, that would be the coolest thing in the world. And their hearts were burning. They were on fire when he was speaking to them and talking to them. And finally, they reached their destination. And, 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 and he says, didn't you know that the, that, the, that the Messiah would have to suffer and die and be, and be raised again? Didn't you know this? Shouldn't you know this? And when Jesus broke bread in front of them, their eyes opened up and they saw, oh, it's Jesus. And they had walked eight miles to Emmaus. And now, in the middle of the night, they get up from where they're at. They, they go eight miles back to tell the disciples that they saw Jesus. And this happened over and over and over again for 40 days. You see, you don't, you, you don't really get a sense of that. When you read the Gospels, it seems like Jesus was raised from the dead. And then like the same day, he's ascended into heaven. He spent time with them for 40 days. In fact, the Paul in the letter of the 1 Corinthians will tell us that almost 500 people witnessed Jesus after his resurrection. Now, now, some people want to say, they want to explain that 500 people had a mass delusion where they all thought this dead guy was walking around. They, they, all, they all think this, right? It's like a big, huge Mandela effect or something. And people want to explain this away. They want to explain, they want to say that the disciples, they, they made this story up. They went and they stole his body from the tomb. And then they went around telling everybody. 
that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so it's not really real. J Jesus wasn't real, really alive. Can I ask you a question? Do any of you know what happened to the 11 apostles minus Judas? What history tells us about their lives? All of them but John were killed, martyred for their Christian faith. They went to their graves not giving up the truth that they knew that Jesus was alive, that he was resurrected from the dead. tell you what, sometimes when I was lying, when I was younger, and my dad would say, all right, one of you is not telling the truth. Now, either one of you tell the truth or you're both getting a spanking. I might not fess up and be okay with me and my brother getting a spanking, right? But if my dad says, okay, both of you die if you don't tell the truth, I think I would say, hey, Dad, it was me. I stole the last cookie. <laughs> nah, it was just me. I took that change from your, your change bucket. Put the gun away. <laughs> and you're telling me 11 people, 10 apostles that saw the risen Jesus Christ Now, Peter, if you don't fess up that you're lying about Jesus being raised from the dead, then we're going to crucify you just like we did Jesus. And what's Peter saying? Crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to die as my Savior. Hey, if you don't tell us that you're lying about Jesus being raised from the dead, we're going to feed you to the lions. I guess I'm puppy child. This is what we stand on as Christians. Yes, do we have faith? Of course we have faith. In fact, we are commended as believers because we have believed on Jesus and have not seen him. We have not witnessed as the apostles did. But we don't stand on a house of cards. We have reasons for believing that what Jesus said about himself and his resurrection are true. We have reasons for believing that. Evidences for believing that. So don't let anybody tell you that you are ignorant for being a Christian. In my opinion, it takes a whole lot more faith to believe that something came from nothing. And that's how we're all here. But what about that last point? So the commandments previously given, the resurrection clearly proven, what about the Holy Spirit promise? Luke says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So one of the last orders that Jesus gave to his disciples was to wait. To wait. Like I said earlier, it's hard to wait. But what Jesus was telling them was that you need to wait for a reason. You need to wait for power. You need to wait for empowerment. You need to wait because I've got a gift coming to you. Do you ever order something from Amazon and then you find out the ship date when it's going to be at your place so you're not going to be there? You're not going to be there to get the package? And then the worst case scenario happens is that you have to be there in order to sign off on it or whatever. 
And so what they do is they take it back to the Whitwell post office. Oh, man. Then you got to find a reason to go into Whitwell and get that thing from the post office. And then when you go in, hopefully there's somebody nice there because they say you're supposed to have the little red ticket or whatever to show that somebody came and tried to, to drop it off. But, but you don't have that anywhere. i got six kids that throw things away in my house all the time. I'm not going to have this ticket that you left at my house saying I got something to... Oh, man, I'm going off on a rant now. Jesus is saying, you got a package coming. you got to wait for the delivery. Don't find a reason to be gone. you got to stay in Jerusalem. Don't go back to Galilee. you got something coming. You see, many people will talk about the reason Jesus came. They'll say, he came to live a life that we couldn't live, a life of sinlessness and perfect obedience to his Father. Yes and amen. He came to die on the cross so that His Father would punish our sins in Christ so that we would not have to suffer for our sins. Yes and amen to that. He came so that three days later after His crucifixion, He could be raised from the dead so that in His resurrection, we might have the gift of perfect righteousness and eternal life. Yes and amen to that. But one time, sometimes, we forget the reason Jesus came. The reason Jesus died, the reason Jesus was resurrected, the reason Jesus ascended to sit at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And it's actually the next holy day after Ascension Day in the calendar. Does anybody know what day I'm talking about? I'm talking about Pentecost. Jesus did all that so that he could pour out the Holy Spirit upon His people. You see, none of what Jesus did, His death, His resurrection, means anything to us if the Holy Spirit does not make His home in us. You understand what I'm saying? How are your sins forgiven? Because they're washed away in baptism when you get the Holy Spirit. How are you a recipient of perfect eternal life? Because God has marked you as His child by His Holy Spirit. How are you to now spend the rest of your life conforming to the image of Jesus? You do that because God is in you. The Holy Spirit, He has made His home with you. We now are united to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. They are to wait for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. Scriptures in the Old Testament mention this. Ezekiel 36 says, I will wash you, I will cleanse you. I will renew your heart of stone, I'll make it a heart of flesh. Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones, says, look at these dead dry bones. I'm going to bring them back to life. This is all about the Spirit coming. You, you might have heard of when a church of God is the Pentecostal church. And, and, and we're, we're Presbyterians. I mean, we don't do that kind of stuff. We don't speak in tongues and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. We're not Pentecostal. L let me remind you. The Christian church is a Pentecostal church because it is embodied by the Spirit of God. We're all Pentecostal Christians because we believe the Spirit has come and He has made us new. He has made us God's people. And, and Je Jesus, He quotes from John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, I have come to baptize you with water, but one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, Luke leaves that out, but why, why does John say he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire? Pretty soon here in Acts chapter 2, we'll see that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends and lands upon the apostles like tongues of fire, right? That symbolism of fire, what's it meant to evoke? It's a purifying fire. 
It's a refiner's fire. Now, back in the olden times, those who were smiths, they were uh, jewelers, the ones who would take the gold and the precious metals, they would refine the metal. And to refine the metal is to heat it up to such a high temperature that the dross, the dirt, the imperfections, the impurities would rise to the top. And you, you didn't have all these machines, and you didn't have all these um, um, things that we have today to do this. And so somebody had to be trained to be able to see that dross and, and time it perfectly where they would scrape that dross off the top as the heat would rise, raise those things to the top. And, and somebody one time asked an old time uh, metal worker, how do you know when it's done? How do you know when all the dross is gone, when all the imperfections and impurities have been taken out of the metal? And he said, that's easy. It's when I can see my reflection. And that's what the Holy Spirit, he's come to do. He's come to refine us, purify us, move out all the imperfections and the old old self and the, and the sins and the, uh, the dirtiness. He's, he's come to remove that until the image of God is seen more clearly in us, reflected more clearly in us. And that's what the Spirit has come to do. And we're going to see the Spirit play a prominent role in the Gospel, in the, in the book of Acts. As we see that the people of God are empowered to do the work of Christ. The people of Christ continue the work of Christ by the power of the Spirit. And we're going to be asking ourselves the question, are we continuing that work? Are we empowered by the Spirit to continue to be the body of Christ in our community as we go from Jerusalem to Judea to the ends of the world? And do we, because of the Holy Spirit, have a faith that can't be shaken, that can't be broken? It's an anti-fragile faith. It's a faith that stands in the face of persecution and with conviction says, these are the things that we hold to be true and we will not let them go. We will live for Christ. We will die for Christ. Do we have that kind of faith? Spirit-empowered faith. And so as we look of the gospel, or at the book of Acts, and we think about all that's been said in the gospel of Luke. Luke begins this book by saying, previously on. And we're going to see how Christ began to do and teach, but also how Christ continues to do and teach through, the, through his people. The people of Christ continue the work of Christ. Amen. We pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've done. We ask, Lord, that you'd walk with us as we study the book of Acts. As we go through it, Lord, may you remind us of the perfect work of Christ and the perfecting work of the Holy Spirit within us. May we know, Lord, that you've called us to greatness continue to be a light, a beacon. May we as the people of Christ continue the work your son has begun until he comes again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.